This review was made possible by contributions from viewers like you. industry is in danger, so that's why we're going to help the CBLDF defend comics. What is the CBLDF? According to the inside cover, the Comic Book Legal Defense Fund is a non-profit organization dedicated to the protection of the First Amendment rights of the comics art form and its community of retailers, creators, publishers, librarians, and readers. CBLDF provides legal referrals, representation, advice, assistance, and education in furtherance of these goals. Doesn't that sound exciting, kids? With that mission statement right on the inside cover, and this collective of super kids on the outside cover, you might think that this comic would be about these kids saving other comics from not being published because they have what might be considered controversial material. But what we have instead is a series of short stories that already are published, so I'm not entirely sure what we need to do to help the CBLDF defend them. Our first story, The Green Turtle Fights for Free Speech, opens in Chinatown, where Mr. Lo, a respectable member of the community, is chasing down a little girl to try to take her comic book. A superhero calling himself the Green Turtle intervenes, and Lo explains that he's rounding up comics to burn in a bonfire, since research shows that comics turn kids into criminals. Mr. Lo fails to see the irony in talking to someone who must logically work outside the law in order to be a superhero, and invites the Green Turtle to attend. What's his reaction? He tosses a grappling hook up the nearest wall, and escapes with the little girl without saying a word. After they're done reading the comic together, the girl asks the turtle why he would take her side. I don't know. Guess I'm hoping for a world where people wear masks only because they want to, not because they have to. The end! So the green turtle's main method of fighting for free speech is... running away. Huh? Seriously, what the hell was the point of this story? Whose free speech was being threatened? Nothing was said about how burning books is wrong. Nobody made the argument that comics can actually inspire their readers, i.e. trying to make their community a better place to live, like <clears throat> a superhero might do. Sure, the little girl was in danger of having her comic taken away, but the turtle doesn't even try to fight for her right to personal property. And he doesn't even know why he helped her. He's hoping for a world where people can wear masks just because? Yeah, sorry, but no amount of fighting for free speech, or whatever cause you want to fight for, however ineffective it may be, is going to stop people from needing masks to disguise their identities while breaking the law. There's another story called Communication Breakdown, featuring Princess Decomposia and Count Spatula. I think there's supposed to be a couple of vampires doing whatever it is that maybe possibly vampires do when their palace is suddenly swarmed by zombies. They send their representative to talk to the princess, but all she can do is murmur and gargle incoherently. The princess has no idea what she wants, but then Count Spetchlet gives the representative some alphabet moose, which somehow allows her to speak intelligibly. Now that that's taken care of, what do they talk about that might quell the unrest between the zombies and the vampires? Nothing! Absolutely nothing! I'm not kidding! In this comic that's supposed to be about the free exchange of ideas, hopefully for the betterment of everyone involved, this zombie woman is finally given the chance to speak her rotten, undead mind, and then the story just stops. What was this supposed to achieve? We have another story that actually does have something to do with the CBLDF, coming to us from Archie Comics. Kevin Keller in Read Between the Lines. The titular Kevin here is eagerly waiting in the public library for the arrival of a new graphic novel called Out and About. The book features different teen stories about... 
coming out. Unfortunately, this particular library patron, who surprisingly wasn't drawn wearing a cross somewhere on a person, isn't too happy about the library putting a comic like that in the children's section. She starts a protest to have the book removed from the library, but Kevin knows what to do. Call upon the CBLDF. Kevin tells them what's going on, and that there will be a town meeting to determine the fate of the book. Later, at the town meeting, Mrs. Jenner makes the case that the book is tawdry material, which makes Veronica snicker. Tawdry? There's a word that hasn't been used since the 1950s. Isn't everyone in the Archie universe stuck in the 1950s? The CBLDF guy makes his case that the book could be educational and informative, and apparently that's the only argument that was needed to have the town council vote 5 out of 7 to let the book stay. While they have their victory, Mr. CBLDF is keen to point out that they must stay vigilant in the fight for the freedom to read. True, because 5 out of 7 may be on our side, but there will always be those other two we have to look out for. Stomping out opinions that differ from our own. That's what the CBLDF is all about. By the way, nobody was protesting the freedom to read. They just thought that this bit of reading material was inappropriate for children. And if the idea was that this book is perfectly okay for kids to read, why would they name this story Read Between the Lines? That sounds a little sketchy to me. The next story, Dragons Beware, Freedom Flambeed, features three small children and... Michael Jordan? Wandering into a cave full of fire-breathing dragons. Claudette here insists on waking them up, but when her friends interject, she accuses them of violating her right to free speech. Here we go. Her friends get out of harm's way and give her the go-ahead to continue practicing her free speech, and she subsequently gets lit on fire. So, is your freedom of speech worth it? Totally. Uh, okay, what the hell kind of moral is that? If you can deal with the flames, then by all means say whatever you want? Freedom of speech is only supposed to protect you from persecution from the government, not protect you from any and all consequences. Just because you can say anything you want from a legal standpoint, that doesn't mean you should. Yes, you are perfectly free to say something as outrageous as, I want to have sex with wolves, but you can't complain about people looking at you funny about it afterwards. Our final story comes to us from Athena, goddess of wisdom. She tells the tale of King Midas after his legendary golden touch was removed. He eventually finds himself the judge of a music contest between Apollo and Pan, and declares Pan the winner. Apollo, however, doesn't take kindly to Midas's judgment. Let your appearance match the stupidity of your ears! It turns out that Apollo gave Midas donkey ears, which were only seen by Midas himself and his barber. He makes the barber swear to keep his secret, but this is a secret too absurd to keep inside him, and he whispers what he knows into a hole that he digs and buries it. However, since the elements themselves heard the secret, it somehow reaches the ears of the people of the town. Athena closes the story with, No matter how much you cover it up, the truth will never stay buried. It will always get out, springing forth like a seedling splitting a stone. Thanks for the downer ending, CBLDF. It really makes me want to contribute to your organization. Well, that was a whole lot of pointlessness, wasn't it? Okay, so one story had something to do with protecting freedom of speech, but the rest of these stories were a complete waste of time. While I do believe that freedom of speech must be protected in all forms of media, some things are just better left unsaid. Since these kids didn't do anything, maybe the kids featured on the cover of our next comic, Shadow Children, will prove to be a bit more helpful. They're standing their ground against Steven Seagal here, while the witch from Hansel and Gretel leers behind them after growing three sizes that day. I love the look on the boy's face. It looks like he's about to do the I am a man punch. Our story is set in a place one step to the left of reality, a place best described as elsewhere. It's a veritable paradise for children to live peacefully with all manner of fantastic creatures, which seems nice enough, if not for the fact that while it's virtually impossible to locate for most, it's apparently painfully easy to find for others. For reasons unknown, this green goblin-looking lady brings children to this fantasy world, where they turn into something... not quite like they should be. Our main character, Jessica, is slowly turning into a vampire, her friend is turning into Sub-Zero from Mortal Kombat, and their older friend, Landon, is... some kind of werewolf, maybe? Years pass, and Brian is able to take Jessica with him back to the real world. 
where they're instantly picked up by this shady guy in a white van with no windows. It immediately takes the dark turn you're expecting it to take, and while Jessica is perfectly content to simply scare the guy by flashing her fangs, Brian takes it a step further and turns him into splatter paint. When pain and fear combine, the result is terror. It is our greatest sin that we allowed this to happen to a single child. They are the children we failed. The ones we left in darkness. Now, when we can no longer protect them, they will protect themselves. They are the Shadow Children, and they remember. How is it that with all the other stories I've gone over in this review, the supernatural child rape revenge story is the best one? The art is very nicely done and really draws you in. The writing is vague enough to be mysterious, but never confusing. And the twist as to what these kids are doing here and why they have powers... Gotta say, I did not see that coming. Be sure to tune in next time when I spend this comic event looking at some event comics. See you later! Subscribe.